Hello friends, this is Mike Williams. I recently had the pleasure of returning to the Opperman Report to discuss the Beatles' conspiracy with Ed Opperman. For those who would like to learn more about whether the Beatles wrote all their own music, please see my presentation links in the description box below. Thanks for listening. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator, Ed Opperman. Uh, you can find me at Opperman Investigations and Digital Forensic Consulting, either through my website, emailrevealer.com, or just contact me directly at my email address, oppermaninvestigations at gmail.com. Now, if you like our show, be sure to check out our Patreon, because uh, we're putting up all the shows uh, uh, that you hear Monday to Friday on AMFM Radio. We're putting up on Patreon ad-free, commercial-free. And uh, good old Ed Parnell is working on this right now, 24 hours a day, getting all those shows up. So there's no more excuses about the shows going up late. Our archives are free. You go to Spreaker.com, find our archives. And uh, as a matter of fact, I do a live show there Friday night, solo show. Uh, I put play repeats every single night uh, on Spreaker.com. You get an email notification when there's new content. And there's a chat room as well. And our guest today, you can find him on the old Spreaker channel there. I just got a... A note the other day on YouTube saying, hey, Ed, you got to get Mike Williams from Sage of Quay on your show someday. <laughs> I said, dude, I've already had him on the show. Might have had him on twice. I have no memory left. Mike Williams, sageofquay.com. You can also find him on Twitter at Sage of Quay. But if you go to sageofquay.com, you can see all the links of everywhere. The guy's every place. Twitter, uh, BitChute, uh, some place I've never even heard of, man. Odyssey, like Mike's do-it-yourself guitar talk channel. Great <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Got a little bit of everything going on. Mike Williams. <laughs> Mike Williams, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, remind the audience, though, who is Mike Williams of sageofquay.com? I'm just a guy, Ed, that uh, was doing podcasting. I still do podcasting, hosting shows like like you do. And, uh, and then my – really my whole – task kind of emerged into getting more and more into uh, presenting my own research versus having people coming on and, and talking about their research. So I started podcasting uh, going back to uh, 2014. I've been a blogger ever since oh, over 10 years ago, and I still do that. I post 10 new uh, blog posts every single day in the morning. So, you know, that's my thing. I, I, I like to do the research, and I fell into the whole Beatles uh, conspiracy going back to um, 2016. I read the book, The Memoirs of Billy Shears. You and I talked about that a little bit in the last show. And uh, from there, it's just been uh, a march forward because the more you dig, the more you find. And uh, that's been the story. So here I am, six years later, still doing it. Okay, six years later. Do you have more questions now than when you started? Oh, yeah. When I first got started, you know, I did not get into the whole piece about the entire Beatle timeline. When I first got started, I was focused on the actual replacement of Paul McCartney. And then I started looking into the entire Beatles narrative, the official narrative. And then that led me into um, whether they wrote all their own music. So that's been very controversial, obviously. There's a lot of people that don't want to hear that. It's uh, it's heresy to go down that path. But I did. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty convinced that I'm right. So that's, I guess, what we'll talk about today. Yeah, that was one of the things, especially Dave McGowan, that he would pull his hair out uh, when you would try and talk to him about the Paul is dead theory, which is the theory that the, the Beatles uh, – that Paul died in an accident, uh, but that he was replaced. I believe he was replaced. I'm not sure if he's dead or not. Uh, but Dave McGowan would have a heart attack, and he would say, how could you find another musician to re replicate what the, the magic of Paul McCartney, the, the musician angle of this, right? You, you know what I'm talking about? Right. Yeah. Tell us then. Then how did they get around that? How did they find another musician as excellent as the original Paul McCartney? Well, you would have to make an assumption that the original Paul McCartney was an excellent musician and songwriter. And my work has shown that um, the Beatles were a construct of Tavistock and they are a manufactured band. And the music that we hear coming from Beatle records especially when we focus in on the 1962 through 1966 period. Those songs were written by ghostwriters, outside songwriters who were on the EMI slash Tavistock staff. I believe that Theodore Adorno uh, was involved from an oversight perspective. It's possible that Theodore Adorno wrote some of the music. Some people believe that he wrote all of the music. I, I don't subscribe to that because he was a very busy man with lectures and books and so on. But he was an accomplished composer. And it is certainly possible that he contributed to the material. I also believe that George Martin was instrumental in not only producing and arranging 
the music of the Beatles, but also from a, a songwriting perspective. And then there were, I believe, uh, probably around no more than a half dozen, six ghostwriters that were contributing to the material uh, in the early period between 1962 and 1966. So when people make statements about how talented Paul McCartney is, that statement is coming from the official narrative. It's the official story. It's the it's the conditioning that's put out there to build this aura around the Lennon and McCartney songwriting team and the Beatles in general. But once I began digging and digging deep, you know, I found that the Beatles were really just four guys that had a story built around them. And I call it the Cinderella story because... It's a story that everybody wants to love and embrace. I loved it and embraced it at one point in my life as well. And I had a rude awakening in 2016 when I read the book, The Memoirs of Billy Shears. That's what set me off to uh, to pursue the research even further beyond the book. So when Dave you know, says that, how could you find somebody you know, as talented and, and so on, that's a standard response. And, uh, and it is interesting that Dave having written the book Weird Scenes from you know Laurel Canyon uh, that he didn't or couldn't get his head wrapped around that the Beatles were also manufactured just like the bands that he spoke about he wrote about from Laurel Canyon um, the music industry I tell my audience Ed the music and entertainment industry is completely controlled and it's a big tool in the uh, in the toolbox of the controllers to be able to push forward their social engineering and their their propaganda and all that stuff so once you like i said once you look at it you take the time to be objective i think that the pieces will begin to fall in place for a lot of people yeah, yeah perfectly worded uh, because in all my dealings with dave mcgowan that, that was the only time he had such a passionate emotional response yep. uh, to, to research and theory and so he, he just man he was ready to fight <laughs> he was ready to fight, man. You know, he 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 had no respect for anybody challenging his opinion on that, and which was totally out of character. You mentioned uh, in all this, you mentioned Tavistock and EMI. Yeah. Now I did a show about EMI, and I'm not thinking about it right now. I'm wondering where the hell did that show go? Because I I look for repeats every night. I, I scroll through all my shows every single night at three o'clock. I, I do it at the last minute. <laughs> I can't find a show to play that night. And I can't find that. EMI has a background in the military industrial complex, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, they do. Yeah. And now, now, who wrote that article about that? Because I had him on the show. I don't remember who wrote it, but um, it's in the memoirs of Billy Shears. They, they talk about it. They talk about the fact that EMI is part of the military industrial complex. Uh, but who wrote that? I, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah. You'll have to find that. Show that you did, Ed. <laughs> yeah, right. Because uh, you know, a lot of stuff disappears, man. <laughs> okay, I'd like say. to hear it, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Now, well, me too. Uh, now, what about them? Um, you mentioned Tavistock, right? Now, the average guy driving along in their car, you know, they have no idea what you're talking about. Tavistock. Who and what was Tavistock? Tavistock is located in England, in London, and they've been around a long time. They've been around approximately a hundred years, uh, a little more. And um, they have been in the business for a very long time of uh, mind control and social engineering. They are part of the overall controlling matrix, the international apparatus that controls the world. You know, that's their function. That's what they do. They are in the business of social engineering. And their social engineering tactics take on many shapes and forms. It can just be pure propaganda. It could be the use of drugs. Uh, they have a, a full suite of techniques that they use to shape how people think, to shape how people believe or what they believe. You know, they're, they're a perpetual motion machine as far as that goes. And of course, a lot of people don't know who they are. And if you go to their website, it just sounds all, sounds real nice. So well, this, is, this doesn't sound like an outfit that is doing something that would be contradictory to humanity or trying to shape something or taking the, you know, the population down a path that many of us don't want to go down. But the truth of the matter is uh, that's the business that, that they are in, social engineering, propaganda, and mind control. Okay, and just like we can confirm, like without a doubt, that e uh, EMI was connected to the military industrial complex, uh, an arms industry, uh, what is your uh, proof or evidence that Tavistock is connected to the Beatles? Well, that that's a good question because I was asked that very same question by Sean Stone. And um, 
My response to Sean was, well, you're not going to find a letterhead, Tavistock letterhead, saying, this is who we are, this is what we really do. You're not going to find that. It takes a lot of research. I've been doing it a long time, Ed, to understand the deep state apparatus, the different organizations, the functions, and so on. And once you understand the players and the organizations, you can start to piece it together and connect the dots. And uh, a, a book that came out in the 1980s, and it's not my only source, is a book by Dr. John Coleman. And John talked about the Committee of 300. And in that book, he explains who the Committee of 300 are, what roles in under the Committee of 300, what the reporting structure is. In that book, he talked about the Beatles being a construct of Tavistock, a, a manufactured band for social engineering purposes. And the social engineering that the Committee of 300 was doing was to upend traditional values, which also included the, uh, the breaking down of Christianity. And uh, so to answer your question, like I said, you're not going to find any document, direct evidence that this is what Tavistock does. Forget about the Beatles. Just anything that Tavistock is involved in, you really have to just understand how the deep state is connected. And, and once you have an understanding of that, then the pieces start to fall in place. And that's what I did. Right. And today, looking back in 2000. 22. I almost forgot what year it was. In 2022, we have the, the idea of the construction of the boy band is now, it's a formula that's been repeated since Menudo and, and One Direction. We see it right before our eyes. Yes. Right. So, so it, it's not like, you know, heresy to, 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 to think that this was going on before they let us know it was going on. Right. So, like I said before, the, the music industry and the entertainment industry is completely controlled. So you have to yeah. ask yourself, well, who's controlling it? And, uh, and that's when you have to take a look at the internationalist structure, the global structure. And from there, you can piece it together. You know, all of the genres of music, Ed, they're all constructed. They're all social engineering initiatives to shape the minds and the beliefs and the values of the population. So, you know, we had, you know, Elvis, then we had the British invasion, which the Beatles kicked off. And we have all other genres, um, we have uh, glam rock, we have punk rock, there's, uh, there's techno, there's hip hop, there's rap, uh, and we can go on and on and on. And each one of those genres of music was put in place in order to move the ball forward until they're able to get to their ultimate goal, which is a one world government, which also includes a, a one world religion. So it's all stitched together. So when I talk about the Beatles, people think they, they isolated in their minds are just thinking, oh, he's just going on about the Beatles and he's he's dismantling, you know, my, my childhood. I get accused of that a lot, you know. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is, if we just set the Beatles aside, we could pick any other major act, major band, and we would come up with, we would find the same exact types of results. This is what the music industry is is, is there to do. It has an agenda to control. Yeah, even, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the research into the Grand Old Opry and Hee Haw and those characters, Minnie Pearl with a little price tag hanging yeah. from her head. Was that like a, a, a Yale graduate? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, and you hear, and there's a lot of anti-Semitism that's sprinkled into that that kind of disturbs me. Uh, but uh, when you look at, these were all well-educated, connected people from wealthy families. These weren't Southern hillbillies uh, portraying these characters. No, that's exactly right. That's the entertainment industry. You know, they're, they're pushing across a message. They're, they're, they're conditioning people. It's, it's very methodical. That's the thing, Ed. It's incremental and it's methodical. Uh, a lot of times I think people think in terms of, oh, the light switch is on and the light switch is off. No, actually, it's, it's like a, a glider. They have to do things incrementally for the conditioning process to take root so that they can move to the next piece of the agenda, the next step in their project plan or their initiative. Although today we're seeing a lot of stuff coming fast and furious. But from about 1960 through, I would say, you know, 2010 or so, the march, regardless of what we're looking at as far as the transformation of our societal and cultural values, was very incremental. The last 10 years or so, not so incremental. They have the, the pedal to the metal. Yeah. yeah. Who is it? Travis Scott, you know, the concert? Yeah. 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 Uh, now, so then that, that begs the question then, okay, then 
this theory that, well, Paul McCartney got into a car accident and they had to scramble and replace him, that can't be, right? If this is this major operation, they didn't scramble for this. They, they were ready for it, right? Or, or, you know, or just replaced him for whatever reason. Uh, so, so what do you make of that? Dead or just replaced? I believe that biological Paul McCartney has passed away. I don't think he's with us anymore. Now, uh, the last time we spoke, I think you asked, well, Mike, uh, is it possible that biological Paul McCartney can still be alive. And I said, well, anything's possible. You cannot discount it. You know, these types of psychological operations that they put in place, they have all kinds of dynamics and variables and angles, Ed, you know. But the reason why I believe biological Paul McCartney is not with us anymore is because I've looked at thousands and thousands of images and I really cannot identify uh, an image beyond 1966 that I can look at and say, you know what, I think that's biological Paul. When you do the analysis, and what I do actually was I took different images of, quote, Paul McCartney, starting from the early years, let's say 1962, 63, all the way through to current day. And when you go through the timeline, you can actually see very clearly, if you look at it objectively with a clear mind, that it's a different person from the 1967 time period going forward. And here's the other thing. The Beatles, all of them had doubles and lookalikes from day one. So along with photos and images of the biological version of the of the Beatle, we also had photos being taken of doubles and lookalikes. And all of this was done in order to convolute the picture. And in the case of Paul McCartney, you know, if you don't do the analysis like I did, where you, you, you put the, the pictures right next to each other and you go through time, if you don't do that, what happens is then you have a composite view of Paul McCartney. He becomes a composite character. And that's why if somebody points to him in 1975 when he's with Wings, that's Billy, right, playing the part of Paul McCartney. And, and you say, well, who is that? Oh, it's Paul McCartney. And then you go back to 1964 to another image of Paul McCartney. And you can see they are two completely different people. They are. I mean, Billy has a, a longer face, a longer jaw. He has different ears. He's He's taller. People will say, oh, that's Paul McCartney. Well, okay, so the guy in 64 right there, that's Paul McCartney. And the guy in 1975 playing with wings, that's Paul McCartney too. Yeah. But then when you put the pictures together and you say to somebody, okay, well, now take a look at those two images. Do those people really look like the same person to you? And that's where some people will stumble. You know, some people will go into denial like immediately. Like, oh, yeah, of course, of course, that's the same guy. What are you talking about? But there are some people who believed it was the same guy who will stare at the picture and then they have that cognitive dissonance or they have that moment like, uh-oh, okay, that actually does look like a different person. There's a lot of comparisons. There's a lot of analysis that we can do that can back up the theory that Paul McCartney was replaced. He was swapped out. Now, whether he died or not, we, I mean, we can argue that till the cows come home. But I, there's no question in my mind that the, the guy that we knew from 62 through 66 is not the guy from 67 on. Right. And and this living Paul McCartney character today is the only one out of all the living Beatles or even the dead Beatles who have maintained that mop top type haircut and these 20 year old facial expressions of a wide eyed uh, youngster. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. These other guys have all become seasoned old men, you know, but, but he's still trying to play that. He's still imitating the 20 year old, you know, out of, out of all of them. Because it's all showbiz, Ed. Yeah. You know? and, and Billy is... He's very, very good at what he does. And, uh, you know, he plays the character and he's always in character when we see him on TV shows and interviews and on stage and so on, you know. So, and you know, we have to remember if he's been in the game since 1966, and he's been doing this for 56 years. That's a long time. So he's got the whole, the whole act down. Now, what do you think? Do you think uh, a lot of people claim that the other Beatles were also replaced? Yeah, you, you hear that. I don't subscribe to all of the Beatles being replaced. I'll give you my quick overview of what I think happened. Paul McCartney was clearly replaced. And then what we have is uh, we have the other three Beatles. As I mentioned before, they were doubles and lookalikes constantly throughout the timeline, Ed, even into their solo careers. If you take a look at John Lennon mm. and you take a look at the double fantasy period, you're going to see at the very least, two different John Lennons. In fact, I did a presentation on this going back about, I don't know, nine, ten months ago. So I, I think that George and Ringo have always been George and Ringo, but 
we're also seeing doubles and lookalikes throughout the timeline. So I don't think George or Ringo died until they actually died. Like George obviously passed away. And with John Lennon, John Lennon's a very interesting analysis because a different John Lennon emerges, a different looking John Lennon, a very different looking John Lennon emerges with the release of Sgt. Pepper. We get this uh, very gaunt looking guy with a pinched nose right above the nostrils. And uh, so when you look at him, you think to yourself, okay, well, he looks very different than the John Lennon we were looking at between 1962 and 1966. So what happened? So I did a video on this and I came to three hypotheses. Uh, one was that John was always John and he had surgery, plastic surgery done between late 1966 through when Pepper was released in June, June 1st of 1967. So he had time to have his face fixed up and changed up. That's one alternative. The other is, is that the original John Lennon was replaced. In other words, he just stepped out of the role after 1966 and a new John Lennon came into play in 1967. And the third scenario is that the original John Lennon and the replacement, the primary replacement from 1967 on, were paging in and out throughout the entire timeline through 1980 when John Lennon was assassinated. So it's it's very tricky. Anybody who comes down and says something very definitive about, oh, they, they all died, there's no way, there's no way to prove that. That's a hypothesis. It's not even a theory. It's a hypothesis. And uh, so to net it out, George and Ringo have always been George and Ringo with doubles. Uh, the same thing with John, although I, I, I put three scenarios out there that are possibilities. And the only one that I believe is was actually replaced, swapped out, was Paul McCartney. Gotcha. Okay, we're going to have to take a little commercial break. Uh, but I just want to throw in my two cents here. Uh, it, it's very uh, – this whole comparison of photographs uh, is is a really um, difficult – Science, I guess, or difficult to, to, because people look different in different photographs, you know? And, and one thing from my experience as a private investigator is when you're, you're given a photograph of somebody and then you're waiting for them to come out of a building, you know, you gotta serve them with some papers or something. And you could stare at that picture and watch everybody come out of that building and the guy will walk right past you. Yeah. Cause you can't, it, it doesn't match. But if you look, if you see the guy, he's standing in front of you and then they show you a picture of the guy from five, you'll say, Oh yeah, that's the guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just the most fascinating thing. You, if, when you see the guy and you look at a picture of the guy, you recognize him. But you look at the picture and the guy can walk right past it and you don't recognize him. I don't know what that adds to the conversation, but it's just something I, I want to throw out there. We are speaking with Mike Williams, a fascinating expert on this topic. Man, i got to have you back more often, uh, Mike. Uh, Sageofquay.com. And you can also find him on Twitter at Sageofquay. Do you tweet a lot, uh, Mike? Uh, only in the morning, Ed, when I put my posts out from my blog. That's it. I'm not a big Twitter user. And, and you write a full blog post every morning? Actually, what I do is I, I, I have a feed of videos that come in uh, from BitChute, from uh, YouTube, and okay. Odyssey, and so on. I post those. Okay. And what other topics do you cover besides this uh, Paul is Dead Beatles stuff? The blog covers everything. It talks about current events You know, that started in March of 2020. I have to be careful what I say here. Um, yeah. Right. But uh, everything. I, I've talked about everything. You know, mind control, everything that we would see and look for in the alternative media, just about. I've covered over the last decade or so. The Beatles piece of it has become larger than life, to be quite honest, since I got into it in 2016. But I still keep my head into the other topics because it's important to understand everything that's going on, not just a major in one thing. Yeah, it's so true. Look, if you if you never heard of the suspicions of Tavistock, then you can't uh, place all this together. Exactly. Right. Or this whole EMI thing. My God, that blew my mind. You know, <laughs> what are you kidding me? And there was another company that was associated with all this too. That was a, uh, I think it was the, their management company. Uh, do you remember the name of their management company? You talk about the Beatles management company yeah, the or Beatles, yeah. uh, NEMS? Yeah, that might have been it. Yeah, that might have been it. That they had some kind of connection too to some kind of military intelligence or something. I gotta find that show. Mike Williams, SageofQuay.com. We'll be right back with more of Mike Williams. We're talking about Paul is dead, but we're really gonna get into the latest thing. I don't think we've touched into it that much, and I don't want to misquote him. Uh, but the actual writing and the origins of the music. Uh, who authored this music? Who created this music? Was it the Beatles? Did they have help? Were they just standing there, <laughs> just uh, reading music? Uh, we'll be right back with more of Mike Williams, Sage of Quay. Way.com after these messages.
Okay, welcome back to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, Private Investigator Ed Opperman. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Opperman Report. Now, we're talking to Mike Williams uh, from SageofQuay.com. We're talking mostly about the Beatles, but the guy does a lot of fascinating work. I really encourage you. Where, where can we find the blog, uh, Mike? If you go to my hub website at SageofQuay.com, there's a link right there. You hit the blog. And like I said, every morning, I've been doing it for over 10 years, 10 new posts every morning. It has to do with alternative uh, research. Excellent. And right before the break, too, I was talking about how when, can you look at a picture and then you guys in front of you, and you wanted to clarify something I was saying. You wanted to remember that? The thing with the, um, the comparisons with the McCartney character is some of the pictures, or a lot of the pictures, are so different, so very, very different that it's obvious that it's a different person. So we're not talking about nuancing. We're talking about distinct differences in facial features, structure, and stuff like that. Yeah, and also, too, we can spend days on this, but there's been so many slip of the tongues, too, you know, and uh, and a lot of bizarre stuff with his brother getting arrested you know, or charged with, you know, you know, groping some woman in a bar. You know, a lot of weird stuff goes on. And, and people back in Vegas, because uh, McCartney would come to Vegas quite a bit, and some people who uh, did autograph signings and who would wait online for him to sign their autograph stuff. It was, it was a guy that would hire you to do that. Uh, would say that he does the same routine. He does the same thing with the eyes, you know, the ho 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 mop top, you know. He, he does that character even off TV. He does it in person. Uh, it, it's an act. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 56 years, Ed. <laughs> it's a it's, long time. It's an act, man. He has <laughs> it down cold. Yeah, right. Uh, now, um, but we really invite you to come on the show. <laughs> To talk about, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to misquote you either, too. But who wrote these songs, and who's playing on these albums? Okay, so let me just back up a little bit. What happened was, uh, going back over two years ago, I happened to be watching a DVD that I purchased. It's the deconstructing the Beatles series, and uh, Scott Freeman is the the author of this series, and he's a musicologist. And I bought the DVD for Rubber Soul. And I wasn't really aware of the Rubber Soul backstory, the official story. And I got about 15, 20 minutes into the DVD, and I said, this is impossible. Because the premise of the DVD that Scott was taking everybody through, and it's the official narrative, is that the Beatles returned from their U.S. tour. They had a six-week break before coming in to record. They had no backlog of songs coming into the Rubber Soul sessions. This is very important to understand. They had no material coming into the sessions. And so they needed to record 16 songs in 30 days, 14 for the album, Rubber Soul, and then two for a double A-side single, which was Day Tripper and We Can Work It Out. And the sessions began on October 11th. They finished on November 11th, and the records needed to be in retail outlets by December 3rd of 1965 in time for Christmas. So being a musician and a songwriter myself and familiar with the recording process, uh, when I heard 16 songs in 30 days, write, rehearse, arrange, record, mix in 30 days, I said, it, it's impossible. You can't do it. I don't care how brilliant people want to say they are and how magical the Beatles were. It's not possible. And uh, so that's what got me digging into it. And uh, the more I dug into it, the more I found there were gaps and holes in the official narrative. And in fact, I find that throughout the official narrative with the Beatles, the, over the entire timeline. And I know you, you do a lot of the same work that I do, but we see this with a lot of conspiracies, Ed, right? People take it at face value and they ride along. But once you start digging into it, it's like pulling the, the thread on a sleeve and it starts to come apart. Well, the, the Beatles story is no different. And so what I deducted is that between the 1962 and 1966 period, the Beatles wrote very little, if any, of the music that we hear on their records and their singles. And who wrote the songs? The songs were written by ghostwriters. They're written by professional songwriters that were on the EMI slash Tavistock team. Theodore Adorno, I believe, was... Uh, the, the point person for the project reporting up into Tavistock, and he was working very closely with George Martin. George Martin was the Beatles producer. Some people will claim that Theodore Adorno wrote all of the Beatles music. I don't subscribe to that. Theodore Adorno had a lot of stuff going on other than just writing music, although, as I mentioned earlier, he was a very accomplished composer. So I believe it's possible that 
Theodore Adorno did write some of the music, as in all likelihood, George Martin. But I believe there was probably around five to six songwriters in the early period between 1962 and 66 that were creating the content, the songs for the Beatles to sing. And one of those people, because sometimes people will ask me, well, who do you think some of these people are? Well, it's impossible to know. But Billy, who plays Paul McCartney now, Billy Shears, he dropped a clue going back uh, about two or three years ago when he came out and said that he wrote the music to In My Life. And John Lennon wrote the uh, the lyrics. And the mainstream media went into damage control because that song, In My Life, is solely attributed and credited to John Lennon, both the lyrics and the music. And so when he came out and said that, they were like, oh, no. So the, the mainstream media came back and said, well, we had some a university or two run some computer models. And you know what? Nope. Paul McCartney misremembered. He didn't write that song. That was all John Lennon. But of course, you don't forget or misremember writing a song like In My Life, which is one of the top rock songs of all time in any rock poll that's ever been taken. So I believe what Billy was telling us, Ed, at that time was he was dropping us a clue. He drops clues all the time. I think he was telling us that he was involved with the Beatles going back into the early years. And he was one of the, uh, the songwriters, the group of songwriters that was contributing material. So I believe that that's possible. And I also believe that he was one of the session musicians that was playing on the recorded tracks. I don't believe the Beatles played on any of the recorded tracks between 1962 and 1966. That was all done by uh, studio players. And I refer to it as the Wrecking Crew model. And the Wrecking Crew, for those folks who don't know, was an American-based, L.A.-based uh, group of musicians that played on literally thousands of pop music songs that you hear that you just take for granted that the bands that you uh, fell in love with were actually playing on those records. Well, it wasn't. It was the Wrecking Crew. So I believe the Wrecking Crew model was, was in play with the Beatles. They were no exception. With Rubber Soul, the problem with it was not only was it that the 16 songs in 30 days, Ed, where you, you, know, you, you write, rehearse, arrange, record, and mix, it, that's not possible. But the other thing that was an impossibility was the cycle time to manufacture the actual record, which included the creation of the album art, the album sleeves, the record labels, and all that stuff. That's a six to eight week process. And that process really starts when the producer creates the final lacquer, which is the final acetate, which then becomes the means to create the stampers to start pressing the vinyl. And that didn't happen until November 17th of 1965, and the Beatles' Rubber Soul album was in retail outlets by December 3rd. Well, that's like, you know, that's like 16 days. That's two weeks, a little over two weeks. But the process is six to eight weeks. And so what I did when I did my analysis, I took a look at the entirety of what was going on. And I, I said, okay, well, in order for this to happen, certain things had to be done and completed by certain points along the timeline in order to have those records in the stores by December 3rd. And so what I concluded was that the, the whole process of the, uh, the creation of the, the album art, the printing of the album art, the record labels that we have on the, the center of the vinyl record, which lists the songs, the order of the songs, that all had to be known and completed by the time the Beatles got into the studio on October 11th. And, and the biggest problem in, that the story has is that the official narrative tells us that Four of the songs for Rubber Soul were not completed until the very last day, November 11th. Now, somebody might say, well, what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that if the songs are not yet known, they might have the names of the songs, but if you don't know the time, the runtime of the songs, then you cannot sequence the songs. Sequencing is, is putting the songs in the order in which they will appear on side A of the, of the vinyl and side B of the record. And... How are you going to create the, the labels if you don't have the sequencing or the ordering of the songs, the labels that go on the vinyl record? So what that told me was the names of the songs were all known. The songs were already recorded by the, times, the time um, the Beatles got into the studio on October 11th. And what I mean by that is George Martin brought together the session musicians to record the instrumental tracks for all of the songs. 
By doing this, George Martin already had the, the names of the songs. He had the runtime. They started the process of getting the, uh, the record sleeves printed, the record labels printed. All of that stuff was in the pipeline already. When the Beatles came in on October 11th, they didn't play anything. What they were there to do was to sing the vocals. That is what they came into the studio to do. So I deducted that between 1962 and 66, that was the model, Ed. The model was the Beatles sang the vocals. They were not playing on the recorded tracks. And that carried over into 1967 and 1970 as well. Although in 1967 with the uh, Sgt. Pepper sessions, Billy at that point was in control of the band. And he brought more of their own material in to the recording session. So we start to hear more of the, the actual songs written by John Lennon and George Harrison. And we start to hear them playing more on the recorded albums. And in fact, when you take a look or take a listen, I should say, and you compare the 1962 to 66 period, the early period to the 67 to 70 period, you're going to hear very distinct differences in playing. It's a different level of musicianship that we're hearing. Whereas the 62 through 66 period was very tight, clearly professional players were being utilized. And then from 67 to 70, it's a, you know, it's a little looser. It's not the same level of tightness with the musicianship on the albums. Although from 67 to 70, I also concluded that they were still using session players and taking in songs from outside songwriters or ghostwriters. So from 67 to 70, it was a mix of their own stuff and outside songwriters. I hope that made sense. I'm trying to cover a lot of ground here for you. <laughs> no, no, it, it does. It makes excellent sense. Uh, and it brings it, it brings up a lot of stuff. Like you hear about Tupac and, uh, and Kanye talking about how uh, Tupac just got out of jail and he puts out an album with it. Oh, yeah, we recorded all 12 tracks in 24 hours. You know what I mean? And uh, again, another suspicious death. And then Kanye and his whole thing. Real quick, now going back, uh, um, you mentioned about how uh, McCartney wanted credit for one of the songs. Do you know the whole controversy about, about Hey Jude with Yoko Ono? Uh, no, run it by me. Well, the same thing. He went to Yoko and said, hey, can I get credit on that? I wrote that by myself. Can, and she says, no, I refuse. Oh, that's what he wanted to switch the credits. McCartney Lennon versus Lennon and McCartney. Right. Yeah, he said that, well, if I was the primary songwriter, I wanted my name first. So... In the beginning, they had a contractual agreement that said uh, all songs would be credited Lennon and McCartney, and Billy wanted to change that. And yeah, and Yoko said no. Okay. Now, um, where can we find your research on this particular topic? Which show is it called? Okay. So if you go to my, my hub website, savejaquay.com, go to the little box that has all of my links to my different platforms, and you're going to see Mike Williams' Paul is Dead channel. So if you click that link, that's going to take you to my YouTube channel where all of my content on the Beatles is there. And specifically, what you want to look for is a video titled, Did the Beatles Write All Their Own Music? It has the most views of all of my videos. Uh, and you'll see it right on my YouTube homepage. Just page down a little bit and you'll you'll see the video. It's four and a half hours, Ed. It was, it's a huge presentation. I cover a tremendous amount of ground. And uh, I also recently put out another presentation where I analyzed their timeline between 1960 and 1963, which is also filled with gaps and holes. And uh, so if you watch those two, uh, did the Beatles write all their own music? And then also the video on the timeline between 1960 and 1963, that will give you a very, very good basis for my research. And from there, there's a lot of other stuff that I take people through, especially the Beatles, how they're immersed in the occult. The Beatles as an entity. So true. And we, we've talked about that, too, as well. I think we talked about it last time. Yeah, so if you're driving along right now and you're making a face, you're saying, eh, I don't know, go go to the source, man. Four hours of research and material. Uh, go check it out. Now, this stuff you're talking about, this took place under George Martin's supervision at Abbey Road Studio? Yeah, so George Martin was I, – I refer to George Martin as the managing director of the psychological operation. Mm. And uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that – when uh, Brian Epstein brought the, uh, the demo tapes to George Martin, he declined. He said, no, I'm not going to sign them. And then according to the book, uh, The Memoirs of Billy Shears, George was overruled. A supervisor called down and said, no, nope, wrong answer. You're going to take him on. And when George did take him on, uh, he wasn't working with him directly. He had uh, delegated that work to um, an assistant producer. 
And then he received another phone call and said, nope, you are going to work with him directly. So I believe he was working very, very closely with Theodore Adorno. And between the two of them, they were bringing this psychological operation to life. And uh, I mean, I have to give George Martin credit. What he did was an amazing piece of work, pulling the whole thing together. Right. Um, also, too, you know, it's fascinating to like the White Album. You know, there's actually a, a movie about them preparing the White Album behind the scenes film that you can't find anywhere. The problem we have, Ed, is this. We have no that I'm aware of. And believe me, I have looked. We have no actual footage. And I mean footage, not recordings, folks, because when you hear a recording on YouTube and they tell you that's the Beatles rehearsing or doing whatever. Uh. You don't know. You don't know who's on that recorded track. In fact, I believe that George Martin and EMI deliberately released snippets like that in order to convolute yeah. any kind of investigation or, or research. But you can't find any footage, genuine footage of the Beatles actually recording an album, doing the album tracks in the studio at EMI or Abbey Road Studios or Apple Studios. The closest we come, Ed, is, is the... Um, the get back sessions, the let it be sessions, even those sessions, in, in my opinion, and I did a lot of analysis on that as well, very suspect, very, very suspect. And where's that footage? There's a movie. Where is it? The only time I could find little clips of it is like it's in another language with subtitles. <laughs> you know, like, is, isn't that worth a lot of money <laughs> like, to put on HBO or something? <laughs> And what about all these suspicious deaths around the Beatles? Stu Sutcliffe, uh, uh, Brian Epstein, you mentioned. What, what, all these mysterious deaths, man. The guy uh, who, uh, the bodyguard, whoever he was, you know, the, uh, was waving the shotgun, uh, the, the air BB gun on his terrace. He got shot by the guy who's investigating JFK, uh, RFK assassination. <laughs> you know, it's just like one crazy thing after another. Yeah, well, the whole Beatle thing is 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 immersed in, as we mentioned, the occult. Yeah. Uh, specifically, Crowley, Thelema, Luciferianism. It's, it's it's immersed in that, and the clues and and the the symbolism that we see is it's clear as day. I mean, if you just look at the Beatles' second album with the Beatles, which was released in November, November twenty second, nineteen sixty three, the same day that JFK was assassinated, wow. it's one eye symbolism. And whenever you call this out, it's like, like we mentioned before, a lot of people just go into denial. Oh, no, it's just RT artwork and, you know, you're, you're reading into this. No, we're not reading into this. This symbolism is everywhere. It's not just with the Beatles. It's everywhere. And the thing is, when you go back to the Beatles, we can see how far back it goes. We can see that it goes back 60 years. And we can even take it, you know, before that. I remember watching, Ed, The Little Rascals. I, I saw something a number of years ago and... They had one eye symbolism in a little rascals <laughs> episode, you know, and that goes back to what the 1930s or I, I don't even remember. So this controlling apparatus and its occultism has been around a very, very long time. And, you know, and so so when I talk about it with regard to the Beatles, it's not specific to the Beatles. It's everywhere. Yeah, go back, find the old vaudeville routine that everyone's done. The Marx Brothers, the yep. uh, um, uh, what's her name, uh, Lyle of Lucy. Slowly I turn, slowly I turn, because I used to do that all the time, you know, uh, as a joke, you know. And I went f to find a video on YouTube. They're talking about some really creepy stuff in that slowly I turn thing, and they've done it over since Caesar. They've done it over and over. They all got to do it. There's something in that thing. Uh, we've been talking to uh, uh, Mike Williams. Great stuff, Mike. I gotta have you back more often, man. Uh, you know. Anytime, Ed. Yeah, because we could talk for hours about this. Sageofquay.com. He's also on Twitter, but go to sageofquay.com and you can see a link. Like he said, there's a box right in the middle. I wish I had a picture of it. Uh, of all his YouTube channels, Rumble, uh, Paul is Dead channel, Spreaker channel, uh, Twitter, all this stuff, man. Mike Williams, thank you so much. You're very welcome, Ed. Thank you uh, for having me back again. You got it, man. Good night.